everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Mishkiki Healing Self and Systems, brought to you by Tamarack Cities Deepening Community. My name is Heather Keem, and I'm the manager of the Cities Deepening Community, and I'm also really, truly excited to be on the webinar today to introduce you to Melanie Goodchild. Melanie Goodchild Moose Clan is a member of the Big Tagong Nishnabeg First Nation. She is a PhD candidate in social and ecological sustainability at the University of Waterloo and as a research fellow with the Waterloo Institute for Social Innovation and Resilience. Melanie is the founder and co-director of the Turtle Island Institute, a project on Tides Canada shared platform. She is a member of the faculty with the Academy for Systems Change in Boston and the Systems Leadership Program at the BAMP Center of Arts and Creativity. Melanie is an International Women's Forum Foundation Fellow Alumni, an executive, leadership, an executive leadership program sponsored by the Harvard Business School and an Insight Seed. Melanie is a proud member of the Iron Butt Association, riding her Harley Davidson motorcycle a thousand miles in 24 hours. Welcome, Melanie, and I'm so excited for our webinar today. I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Heather. Miigwech. Bonjour and dinner wamaga na duk. Wapshke ubicha dakwe as anang indigene kaz. Wab nang indigene kaz. Moose do dem. Bik tigong nishnabeg donjaba. Kitigong zibi donjaba. Apichigo miigwech. Bizin dawayag. I said uh, greetings to you, all of my relations, all of my relatives. That's what I said when I said bonjour and dinner wamaga na duk. I introduced you uh, through a traditional protocol of the Anishinaabe. I am. Uh, Anishinaabe Kwe, which means I'm a, an Anishinaabe woman, and in our culture, we introduce ourselves with these protocols. So I said my two spirit names, my clan, and where I'm from. I'm going to share my screen as well um, in a moment, but talking about Mushkiki, what that means in our language is medicine. Anishinaabe Mwin is our, the, the original language of our ancestors, and I'm just learning. Um, I'm just learning to speak. Uh, my own language. Uh, my mom and dad are both uh, residential school survivors. My father Delaney went to Spanish residential school and my mom Melinda went to Roman Catholic Indian Day School in her community, Garden River First Nation. My dad from Heron Bay. Uh, but he used to take me on the land and I'm going to talk about that. But first I just wanted to share a few words and I wanted to, when we talk about mushkiki, when we talk about medicine, we certainly can think of it in terms of English. Um, you know, th those, those things in life that are given to us that provide us with an opportunity for healing. And I think healing, healing self and systems, uh, it's probably more and uh, I think it's been relevant quite some time. But, uh, you know, if climate change wasn't enough to create anxiety and grief and a sense of loss, then we've now experienced together as humanity, uh, the pandemic of, of COVID-19 and that crisis. And then recently in Canada, this weekend, we experienced the horror of a mass shooting. And I want to acknowledge all of our relatives around the world. Uh, in It means that I am speaking to you and we are all related. Uh, to acknowledge the suffering, um, the grief that the families in Nova Scotia uh, must be enduring right now and healing the healing work uh, that I've been you know, doing myself in self and systems and, and as a systems thinker um, often involves grief. That's often the heart of what uh, many people are experiencing when they realize that they're on a healing journey. And, and I would say I'm on a healing journey. I've certainly been on a healing journey myself through this crisis and I'll, I'll talk about that as well. When we think of mushkiki, we think of, you know, those material and non-material um, helpers that provide with us an opportunity to feel the emotions, to experience, you know, what it is that, that we're learning about. And I'm going to talk about the medicine wheel teaching today. And in that teaching, we talk about the medicines that have been provided to us. And we have four sacred medicines. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to light a smudge because I have uh, medicine bundle of my own that I, I look after. And so the four sacred medicines uh, for the Anishinaabe include sage. This is sage. 
It includes our uh, SEMA, our traditional tobacco, which is here. It also includes cedar, and it includes our, the hair of Mother Earth, our sweetgrass, which smells really beautiful. So I'm going to smudge the, the items because I'm going to talk about three, uh, three or four of my spirit helpers and just generally talk about Mishkiki before I talk about um, healing self and systems. And so if you'll just bear with me for a moment, I'm going to light the sage now. I'm going to say a few words for the medicines in Anishinaabe uh, Mumen. so for us in Ishnabe, and and i'm sure for many um for other indigenous nations the the gift of the medicines of the mishkiki um, can heal physical ailments like we think of medicine doing um, but they can also provide us with the the activation is what the elders often say they talk about the activation of our spiritual selves and in doing this because i'm going to rely on these spirit helpers while i talk to you um, I wanted to acknowledge them and offer us a group smudge, even though you're there on the other side of a computer screen, um, that doesn't take away from the ceremony here and, and the acknowledgement of the medicines. And so I acknowledge the four cardinal directions, and that teaching is in the medicine wheel. And those directions have uh, beings that live there and provide these four sacred medicines. We also have other types of medicines. We have, uh, this is bare root for example, that we grind, we grind up for some of our, our medicines. This is some chaga. Um, we have, I use this quite a bit. We used to call it swamp tea, Labrador tea, having a cup of tea. Um, and you can think about all of these in your own, you know, practices as well. That is so much of medicine involves our five senses. It's, it's smelling this beautiful sage that's burning. It's smelling this sweet grass and and bringing that memory back. And that when we burn our medicines like this, it's taking those, those prayers and those feelings. And I offered prayers to the four directions and to the people who are suffering right now. You know, I've heard a lot of people talking about the guilt. Uh, it's almost like a survivor's guilt that, you know, that you're okay, that you can self-isolate. Uh, perhaps you're resilient in, in some way that other people that you love and care about are not resent that they've lost their jobs that they are experiencing this you know uh, grief that comes with what's been happening in the world and so um, and we're building community online through zoom and, and chat rooms and things like that so um, I think that's really powerful 
one of the things we've been doing in my house is this is our protector. Um, each of these medicines plays a different role. Sage is purification. Uh, that's why when we do this smudging ceremony, you'll see uh, that we smudge our thoughts, what we see, what we smell, what we say, and we smudge our hearts and we smudge our bodies. This cedar is the ceremony that I rely on quite a bit when I'm scared. And this is a pretty scary time. Um, I know I've been experiencing anxiety and we boiled cedar last night and uh, it's really beautiful, the, the smell of it, but you also put your head over it and you inhale that into your nose and your lungs. And you, we have this actually hanging over our doors. I mean, we do cedar baths. Uh, on the West Coast, I was with uh, Chief Robert Joseph, Bobby Joe from uh, Reconciliation Canada. I had the honor of helping him, uh, myself and my friend Nicole, uh, of a brushing off ceremony. And I've been in ceremony in Sartlip First Nation where we had cedar boughs placed in the ocean and, and recognizing the ancestors there. So, so cedar plays an important role. And it's different. I do want to say indigenous knowledge and wisdom. We say Gedakimanan is our, our uh, ways of knowing, the original ways of knowing, and Indamawin is our wisdom. Uh, they're very place specific. Uh, they're not, they cannot sort of be generalized. So if you're hearing me talk as a young Anishinaabe, um, uh, Skabe, I'm a helper. Uh, Skawebis in the in the lodges. I help my aunties and uncles and and relatives back home that are the medicine people. I've been learning how to do that since I was 13. Uh, but cedar's different, and I learned that uh, when I went on a medicine walk in Salish territory. And the red cedar on the west coast of Canada cannot be boiled and made into a tea. Uh, it has a property that makes it uh, different than our cedar here. And so I learned that before I boiled myself a cedar tea out there. So we drink this often, cedar tea. Uh, this time of year, we're usually having our spring ceremonies. Um, last month, we would have had ceremonies for the, the bear cubs, and we would have been drinking uh, water from the maple tree. So Meshkiki in our uh, culture comes from the land. It all comes from the land. It's natural. And one thing COVID has been teaching me is the elders that, that I check in on and check in on me have been giving me medicines. They've been saying what to do with the wike we have, with the bear grease, all of the, the medicines we have to protect ourselves from the, the flu and also from anxiety. So, um, so I think what I'll do now is I'm gonna share my screen because we wanna leave time for uh, a discussion and some questions at the end. So I've done a little PowerPoint here going to make us a bit smaller. So this is the homelands of, of where I'm from. My grandparents are from four different uh, First Nation communities and four different, uh, what we would say in the modern uh, terms, uh, treaty areas. And so my grandfather, uh, my dad's side is from Biktagong, Nishnabeg. It's a uh, called Heron Bay or Ojibwe's of the Pick River First Nation on the shores of Lake Superior between uh, Marathon, near Marathon, Ontario, up near Thunder Bay. That's Robinson um, Superior Treaty Area. My mom, she, and that's where my dad's from, Big Tuganishnabeg. His mother, so my grandmother on my dad's side is from Arrowland First Nation in Treaty 9. Um, Isabella Mendewega and my grandfather was Lewis Goodchild. On my mom's side, her, grand, her dad or my grandfather is from Kitagon Zibi, which is Guard River First Nation in Robinson Huron Treaty area um, near Sault Ste. Marie, the town of Sault Ste. Marie. And then my grandmother on my mom's side is from Kuchiching in Treaty 3, uh, which is on Rainy, Ray, Rainy Lake. Um, and that's where I spent a lot of time. I grew up uh, visiting the home communities, but I lived in Big Grassy First Nation for a number of years and Laxewell First Nation in Northwestern Ontario. So these are, these are some images from home. Um, like many of you, I miss home and going out on the land. This is my uh, Dodamowin, and this is our clan. We have a clan system. And so when I introduced myself, I talked about Mo's clan, Mo's clan in Dodem. That means that's my clan. And so there's certain teachings that come with uh, the responsibility. And, and as part of the Hooft clan, we, we are actually some of the intellectuals of our, our nation. And I think I'm a systems thinker, and that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about here in Healing Self and System in a couple of different ways. I'm a systems thinker through Anishinaabe, Gik, and Dasawin, our original ways of knowing. Uh, 
And I'm also a scholar of systems thinking. So I study that in my PhD at Waterloo. Uh, I study systems thinking, complexity theory, resilience thinking, social innovation um, at the Waterloo Institute. And that's my dad and me. Um, and he always took me out on the land. He took me fishing. And I think he gave me the need for speed because we often rode, rode our skidoo and our boat really fast. And we rode uh, go-karts. Um, and so maybe that's why I grew up to be a biker. But anyway, he took us fishing uh, quite a bit. And what he did was he taught me our language as much as I can remember. He would teach me the words for things, the words for animals. And he liked really long walks in the bush. And he died from leukemia uh, when I was nine years old in 1981. And at that point I lost in four years my dad then my mom's youngest brother, who was living with us at the time, he was 28, committed suicide. And then my grand, and I lost my grandmother and my grandfather. So I grew up pretty quick and really became aware of the power of grief um, and also ceremony. I went into my first mom and wedding, which is a sweat lodge, uh, when I was 13. So what, what the medicine wheel teaching can, can teach us is this principle of mino vamatsuin. Mino means good and vamatsuin means life. And so when we talk about living the good life, we're talking about living a balanced life. That's what we say when we say Amino Bamatsuin. In kind of the, the bigger picture of the work that I do with Turtle Island Institute, uh, I'm trying to actually build the field of systems awareness and systems change and transformation. So I do a, quite a bit of work with different partners. One of the partners I have is the Presencing Institute and the Academy for Systems Change. So these are my colleagues here. We did a webinar in October of 2019. It was a webinar for the Dialogues on Transforming Society and Self that Otto Scharmer had organized. He's now doing another project called Gaia Online. And this is a, a picture of me and, and Peter Senge and Otto and Kelby Bird, who, who was doing uh, what she calls uh, generative scribing. And this is what she scribed, and I thought this was beautiful. Um, capture of our of our discussion on that webinar and it was interesting that that webinar was limited to 500 people and it sold out in a day with 500 people from 56 countries on seven continents and what that showed to me was the eight fire prophecy which is that the peoples of the world would come together and, and engage in what we call gechiga kinua matawin gechiga kinua matawin is the, the act of deep teaching that we would have matured enough to now be able to teach each other the gifts that we have. And that's there, the eight fire prophecy you'll see up in the corner with the medicine wheel. And I talked about the medicine wheel on that webinar. The turtle rattle that I have has 13 moons um, on the back because that's what turtle shells have. So our calendar is different, 13 moons and 28 cycles. And this turtle rattle that I shook at the beginning when I offered some words, um, to the spirits and to the medicines here, that turtle rattle has an abzokin, which means it has a legend and a story that, um, that I can talk about a little bit later, but I wanted you to see this, this diagram. What the, what the name of this talk was, Indigenous Wisdom and the Civilizational Shift from Ego to Eco, and this comes out of Theory U, and, and certainly you'll recognize it if you're familiar with Theory U and Otto's work where he's talking about climate change and the big you know, challenges, deep-rooted challenges we have within capitalism, within patriarchy, within all of these human-created systems that produce undesirable outcomes, that egocentric thinking is pretty much the heart of you know, individualistic thinking and the way that we think about capitalism. And now, through the time we're in now, certainly with the pandemic, when we see suffering, uh, and also when we see what Mother Earth has been going through, we need to shift to eco. So he calls that civilizational shift. And that really is what our elders um, have been saying and talking about for quite some time when they've protected our cultural protocols. The cultural protocols are often learned through ceremony and ritual. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and about elders and, and spirituality in this work. So this is the medicine wheel. And... This is a teaching that I received from, you know, elders. Uh, I didn't really read about it. I've 
seen it now that it's out there. Um, it's been used to develop curriculum and models. It's a, you can think of it as a heuristic. But for us, it's actually a prophecy. The prophecy is that the four cardinal directions, the north, the east, the south, and the west, represented also the four great, be great beings. And it also represented the four great nations. So the white people, yellow people, red people, black people, and everybody is included in that. And then it represented the four gifts. And the four gifts are spiritual, mental, physical, emotional. Those are the gifts that make up each individual human being. And we are just spirit beings on a human journey. And so connecting to those is so important. And that's what I'm going to talk about in, in Healing Self and Systems. And this is a picture of me and my auntie, Lynn Skeed. Uh, she's a Anishinaabe Meshkiki Kwe. So she's a Anishinaabe medicine woman. Um, she doctors people in our lodge back home in Wazushkunagam, uh, which is, uh, used to be called Rat Portage in Kenora. So in terms of spirituality, when we think about the medicine wheel as that the human being, that you have four parts of yourself, the spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional. I think the spiritual is sometimes the one that we neglect. Um, it's really the non-material dimension, the dreams, visions, symbolic representations. And it's also a guide for future action. For us, our ethics, our axiology, um, along with our epistemologies and ontologies come from the earth. And spirituality also really helps when you're on a healing journey. So I talked about Gikandasawan and Indamawan, our original ways of knowing and our wisdom. What the medicine wheel introduces for us is a spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional doorway to transformative change and addressing society's most intractable problems. So I've been developing programs, um, workshops, uh, you know, partnerships with lots of different systems change organizations and people who are recognizing the anthropocentric centric bias of conventional systems thinking. And so when I say the anthropocentric bias, for, for folks who aren't familiar with, with what I'm trying to say there, you know, we know that the global epoch that we're in has been labeled by climate scientists um, at the Stockholm Resilience Center and others who have looked at planetary boundaries around climate change and other, you know, limits to growth, limits to the, the um, what the biosphere can take. It's essentially what Mother Earth can withstand, that there are limits. However, those theories are often, including even definitions of sustainability and resilience, they have an anthropocentric bias. They have a blind spot in that those are created for and by humans. And it's, it's what Peter Senge calls a mindset. We still have the same mindset that humans are the center of the universe. But in Anishinaabe, Gikandaswan, and Indamanwan, we're reminded all of the time by all of these helpers, by the turtle rattle, the migazimiguan, the eagle feathers, by the medicines that come from the land that we actually rely on everything that mother earth provides for us because we're the youngest siblings where you can find out a lot about uh indigenous knowledge and wisdom is in our creation stories whether it's the maori people in new zealand the lakota people blackfoot salish the Mi'kmaq people the Anishinaabe, we all have stories about where we come from and why we were placed uh in our case in Anishinaabe on the back of a turtle and that's to live you know, and we're the youngest siblings and so the elements the moon the stars the sun the elements fire wind earth water that all came before us then the two leggeds and the winged and uh i have uh two haudenosaunee mohawk spiritually adopted uncles um blaine loft and dan longboat who uh, have taught me about the teachings of the haudenosaunee people and that's the traditional territory i live on I live near Niagara Falls, so I'm on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and, uh, and the credit people here in the Anishinaabe. We don't do it, I just want to mention, we don't do uh, often, a, whenever, you know, it came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to do territorial acknowledgements. When I introduced myself in Anishinaabe Mowin, that was my uh, territorial acknowledgement. Speaking in my language introduces my spirit to the beings here. And so that's how I do a territorial acknowledgement. Others you'll see will do that by looking um, at where you're from and whose land and, and territory it is. And they're the original um, keepers of that land and the stewards of that land. So in the spiritual, mental, physical, emotional, unlike the biomedical model, 
which describes healing as the absence of disease, and certainly we understand that's a part of healing, uh, but that kind of relates more to the physical aspect. If we're going to think holistically about healing self and systems, what I've you know, been exploring is, is how do I tap into the frequencies, is what the elders talk about, the frequencies of spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional well-being. What that reminds us of is the concept of teaching, uh, is the concept of balance, sorry. That's the teaching of balance. That's also what the medicine wheel offers us. So I remember talking to an elder about this. I used to teach at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Uh, I guest lectured there for 15 years uh, to young physicians in training. And I would say, you're probably going to meet people that experience something that the Lakota call Wakiksuyapi. Wakiksuyapi is memorial people. And that's when you carry trauma in your DNA. And the Holocaust survivors experience Wakiksuyapi. Uh, the Lakota because of wounded knee and the attacks on their people. And most indigenous peoples who have been dispossessed from land have suffered genocide, have suffered through, you know, progressive assimilationist policies that actually made the ceremony I did today. Um, that was illegal, you know, for my grandparents and great grandparents. Uh, it was banned in Canada. So, um, and so all of these four dimensions, if you're tapping into the frequencies within your own being and the frequencies around you that are spiritual, mental, physical, emotional, then we define healing as the presence of balance, which is a bit different than the absence of disease because the presence of balance involves all of those parts of your being. So you can be quite sick physically. In other words, you could have a terminal illness but if you're spiritually, mentally, and emotionally balanced, you may not suffer as much. Um, so that's the teaching there. How to activate that teaching, I've found, and it comes back to me over and over personally, is go onto the land. Participation in ritual and ceremonies activate all four of the cardinal directions within us. And a key to that is language. So when I was writing my comprehensive exams, and those of you who are students or have been students, you know, we have to write these big papers. I was writing my comprehensive exam at Waterloo. Uh, my PhD is in social and ecological sustainability. So I was reading a lot of climate science. And I kept reading things like um, the, the services, the ecological services that the earth is providing. And I thought, wow, that's, that's very kind of arrogant of humans to call it that. Um, and measuring, you know, in monetary what a river offers and things like that. Anyway, I was finding myself really troubled and I texted, you know, different elders back home and phoned them. And, and one elder said that I should have a cedar bath and because I was really disturbed by how science was talking about Mother Earth, not as a relative, but as a thing. Um, and then we find in our language, in Shnabemawin, that we don't have a noun-based language. Instead, we have a verb-based language. And so it's very easy for us to reconcile that a tree or a river is a living being because we already assign animacy to it. Whereas English kind of does a disservice to us. Like how do we, how do we address our anthropocentric bias if we're calling a tree an it? It's very different to look at the tree nation. Uh, my brother Keith, Fresno and Garden River calls it the stick nation. And so I asked the elders, how would we say resilience? Because I know in the studies that I was doing, resilience was defined as complex adaptive systems and their capacity to withstand a shock and absorb that shock and not flip into something unrecognizable. In other words, to maintain its previous identity. And these are the answers I got. Sibiskagad from Rene Mishaki, my dad's cousin. Sibe River, Biska flexible, God it is. You might say that resilience is described as a river flowing flexibly through the land. And Nishnabe Mawin is embedded in the land. And my sister, Eleanor Skeed, Lynn's sister, in Wajushkunagam, uh, Mamasinjige is the act of twists and turns and moves. Mamasinjwan is the water flow in twisting and turning. There always has to be context with Ojibwe words, like you need to introduce how the word has been used. Interesting, when I was writing my comps, that two elders gave me two different words, but all relating to the flow of the river that continues to go through the landscape. Particularly, Eleanor said, are you near a river? And I was, I was near the Nith River in Waterloo. 
And she said, that river is teaching you. You have to go down there and pray and offer your tobacco, your samine and berries and feast. And I invited a Haudenosaunee friend of mine to come by because I don't have the gift song. I don't sing. And she came and sang songs to the river for me. And in my acknowledgments of my comprehensive exam, I thanked the Nith River. I thanked the river for teaching me to give that gave me this teaching of what resilience is. And so the twisting and turning, I think medicine, mushki ki is part of that medicine. So how do we learn about these things? This is my methodology, um, tea around the campfire. Fire is sacred. Uh, we have teachings around balance, again, with fire and water. My husband's a fire keeper. We have fire. We had a fire yesterday. Um, it's very healing. We have sacred fires for four days at traditional burials, for example. There's lots of teachings around fire. Women are water keepers. They sing the water song. And so my late um, Auntie Josephine Mandamin was a water walker that walked around the Great Lakes with uh, her water in copper pails. And my niece, Autumn Pelche, is a water warrior, young girl who you may have seen talking to the UN, talking to the Prime Minister um, about the fight to protect our waters. And so having tea around a campfire and, and tea, even as a ritual, is, is still important in my life. I'm the, we're big tea drinkers here. And we've been having gung fu cha tea ceremonies. Uh, we were taught Japanese and Chinese tea ceremonies. And we've been doing that. So there's lots of different types of medicine to, you know, I'm sure you're all engaged in things to get us through this. So just going to tell you a couple of quick stories here. I was asked by NASA, colleagues of mine in NASA in the States, to bring together elders and Native American communities, indigenous communities, with some of their scientists. And so there were scientists from the Goddard Research Center, um, from headquarters in Washington, and from the Ames Research Center in California. And they said, we want to bring together some of the indigenous uh, partners who are using GIS technology, uh, satellite imagery, real-time satellite imagery to manage their lands, right? Like the Navajo Nation, which was experiencing a drought, was using this GIS technology to monitor drought. You can monitor deforestation. Uh, Sami reindeer herders are using this technology with NASA to see, because of climate change, the snow is melting differently and, and, and creating these really hard layers of ice on top of the snow and the reindeer can't break through to get their food. And they can, they can see where these pockets of hard snow are through satellite images. Anyway, that's just an interesting side note. What they asked is, should we meet in, in Washington, D.C.? And I suggested, no. How about we meet somewhere else? I said, reach out to your partners and let's go on the land and let's go meet them where they're from because Indigenous peoples um, are often asked to come to, you know, wherever the conference is or the meeting is. In this case, it was Washington. And so we, and so Ray Cliff Reservation in Wisconsin on the, the southern shores of the Great Lakes gladly you know accepted the invitation and this is what they did they took us on the land and they shared stories some really beautiful stories about their land about the rice then um the struggles that they've had to protect their land uh and this is melanie here um and my friend cindy from nassau we went for walks in the bush and melanie's dad is an elder frank he taught us about and while we were on that beach there um, he found a migazemig one, an eagle feather, um, on that beach. And so we had some really beautiful teachings for three days. And it was the first time, I understand, that Nassau had a meeting that was not, you know, kind of in a hotel or uh, the first time they were on the land and the first time certainly they were on a reservation in an Indigenous community. Finally, this one, the gathering in Six Nations of the Grand River. I've been working with a group that's looking at traditional foods, food sovereignty, country foods, food security, uh, specifically in healthcare systems. And we, this is uh, an elder from Haida Gwaii, and we were hosted uh, locally here in the Six Nations of the Grand River, and we went out into the cornfields. And so these are all healthcare workers. This was a uh, year and a half ago in Six Nations, learning about the teachings from the Haudenosaunee people of corn. And so people of the corn have really beautiful teachings about the kernels of corn. It's related to medicine. You know, you can take the hair off the top of the corn, what we call the hair, boil that into a tea. It's really good healing. Um, and so there are really some, you know, beautiful teachings 
that we learned, but we had to go on the land. I think it would have been different if we were talking about corn and just not experiencing it. And these are, you know, generations of, of corn keepers that are passing on their knowledge. And we learned how to braid the corn, which was wonderful. And then we had a big feast after. And this one, the fellowship, so the Academy for Systems Change is in their second cohort right now of a systems leadership fellowship. And this was at Brew Creek where I first met uh, my colleague here. And uh, I've since joined the Academy for Systems Change faculty, but what you see there on the right uh, is that I offered with my blog a pipe ceremony for uh, the folks here. I took that picture for myself. I'm sharing it here um, and have the protocols to be able to photograph some of these items, not all of them. Um, I don't photograph everything, but this was a, a set of chairs underneath the red cedars. And it was the first time that the cohort was engaged in ceremony and it profoundly shifted the cohort program. I think the, the academy um, faculty and the way that the programming was done because the academy recognized and it continues to recognize its own anthropocentric bias or its blind spot around spirituality. That conventional systems thinking, while it offers us a lot, um, does have some limitations. And so this quote here from Peter, give me a lever long enough and single-handed I can move the world. I think it speaks to the power that we all have individually. The success of the intervention depends on the interior condition of the intervener. Uh, that's Brian Arthur's quote, you've probably heard that. And I really believe this, this kind of motivates my work, that starting with healing self is where we begin to understand how to heal systems and to heal Mother Earth. So miigwech apajigo, miigwech bizindaw yug. I say thank you for listening and uh, we can open it up for discussions and questions now. I will say the elders are the leaders who tap into the frequencies of the land. Uh, they help me in my own healing journey. These are some of them here. That's Laura Horton. Um, and on the end, there's Albert Hunter. Uh, they help me when I need to find Meshkiki, which is the specific medicine that I might need uh, to do transformative systems change work. And those medicines, I'm going to wrap up by sharing i experienced anxiety uh, about a week and a half ago and i had a panic attack and i've never had one before it was the first time i ever had one it was a particularly rough day i was hearing a lot about the pandemic and the suffering and so i i found myself i couldn't breathe and then i thought i had a temperature and i'm gonna make this sort of it's kind of this that's kind of a funny story but i'll make it short I was freaking out and we don't have a thermometer in the house. So I started yelling at my family. I couldn't breathe. I started to actually have a panic attack. I had another one at three o'clock in the morning. I had another one the next day. And so finally I talked to my brother, Julian Norris. Um, and he said, okay, you don't have a thermometer. Do you at least have a meat thermometer? And he said, it's not medical grade. And I said, yes, we have a meat thermometer. And he said, okay, well, I said, I don't even want to know where I'm supposed to stick that because it's sharp, but I will take it. And I ended up putting it under my arm on my mom and my husband. And we've been sheltering in place for a month. Looked at it and said, okay, you don't have a fever. But I was terrified of, of, of what got me really scared in that moment was making my family sick. I, I wasn't sort of even panicked out about what it might be like when I'm sick. And so we've been staying home and doing our part um, during this crisis uh, by staying home but also by uh, having our ceremonies. And so my brother Keith had a sacred fire, a four day fire last week. While he was having the fire, we had a ceremony here and we made our tobacco ties and he sent that energy out for everybody. And so that's, I think what's so important about um, healing self is that to fully understand holistic thinking and systems change, we have to be, have some preconditions. And one of them is humility. And another one is respect and healing can really help uh, get you ready to be humble and respectful in this work. So thank you for listening. Miigwech. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to say you're not alone. Um, I like to say I'm a strong person and I am struggling with this time. And I feel like, I feel like things are coming into play in that, um, I got invited to join meditation, which I've never done before. 
and, and, you know, and it's, and I, and I'm, and I'm embracing it. I'm struggling because my mind keeps going, but I'm still pursuing through it. And I feel like, um, this webinar and listening to you talk about systems change and the medicine wheel and, you know, how we have to look at the inner self. I feel like things are aligning that I need to look at my inner self and figure out how, am, how am I going to transform myself during this COVID time? Um, but I have a question to you about transforming. So I know I want to transform myself. My anxiety is that I don't want to go back to the way I was. I don't want to go back to the busyness. I don't want to go back to um, my, my kind of drive through dinners with my children. And so um, we had a lot of questions about, you know, the, the pandemic and um, the way society is now with COVID. Can you talk about, you know, how we could use what you learned to, what we learned today to transform ourselves? For sure. Thanks. Um, I think transformation, when we talk about it from a systems perspective, we're actually talking about, you know, a changing and, and there's something called the panarchy cycle. I'm sure some folks are familiar with the adaptive cycle. Mm -hmm. That change is a continual process. And so it's represented in an infinity loop and, and there's sort of like a creative destruction and then there's like a, a place where you're kind of maintaining the status quo, but then we come right back into uh, a creative destruction phase where we're looking at something new and this has prompted us and this is a prompt I'm sure for many of us uh, we've seen that happen historically before where something quite major happens whether it's a, you know um, at, at whatever scale so it could be at the scale of your particular community your family perhaps where there are wake-up calls, I guess you could call them. You know, that's why we use the term woke often in critical race theory. Somebody who's woke to, whoa, I didn't know, like recognizing your own privilege, for example. I think privilege is a huge part of that. I've been grappling with privilege of the fact that I own a home, that my family is here and my mom is here with me. We bought a house with an in-law suite. She's 72. She has type 2 diabetes. I have type 2 diabetes. We're at risk, uh, particularly for the kidney failure and other things that are coming with this this pandemic and I think in terms of transforming it's about practice it's about activation um, I did a webinar last week and I was talking to someone about helpers and you know this is my medicine pouch and in here I have a bear claw and the reason I have a bear claw is when a friend of mine passed away and um, I looked after her when she was dying I was only 25 and she was Irish um, and she was a fiery Irish woman. And she said, I'm gonna die at home. She was dying of cancer. And so she died at home and I was asked to look after her. Uh, and I took on that responsibility fairly young. And a bear came to me because my stepfather said, you need help because it's going to be very hard when your friend passes away. And it was, the morning she took her last breath, she died in my arms. It was so painful, I hadn't expected that. And I had, the strength of the bear with me and I had it represented in the bear claw. So I think not going back to something pre, so for me not going back to that experience, which was quite profound for me to be there when someone dies. Um, and that comes with trauma. You know, I've talked about what kicks those, those traumas that we all carry are in our body. And my panic attack last week was my brother saying, he says, actually you're quite well balanced sort of spiritually, but emotionally and physically, the body was letting out what I was holding in, which was that I was feeling quite scared for myself, but also for other people who were sick. I was feeling really awful for the long-term care facilities and the people who are most at risk are our elders in society. And we've set up a system where they became the most at risk and are suffering the most. I mean, that's, that's pretty um, disturbing. So we, so moving forward, I think transforming is to, to remember, you know, I mean, People have talked about keeping journals and things like that. I also think it's important to remember as things shift in whatever the next phase brings us together, uh, that remembering what we relied on um, is so important. Like for me, I'm thinking about, you know, the cedar tea. You know, I, I, I do that in ceremony, but I don't always do that in my home. And I'm realizing now how important the medicines are for me and I don't want to forget that so I think what I'm going to have to do is is practice and encourage myself to continue practicing things into the next phase um, when things feel better to not forget. Mm -hmm. 
Great, thank you. So we've got some questions coming in through. Um, the first lot of questions are around, um, do you have any other books and further reading? So we had quite a few questions come in about um, how do we continue our learning? Um, what, you know, how do we learn more about what you're doing? So can you just talk, let people know where they can go for more learning? Mm -hmm. Sure. I think um, uh, there are quite a few references now in terms of books, you know, for a long time, and I'm just going to say this because people often ask around this, uh, a very parallel question around um, uh, cultural appropriation. So when a knowledge keeper like myself, uh, just a young knowledge keeper in training or an elder shares teachings, shares about medicines, shares prophecies or clan teachings that will usually give you the the protocol and the protocol is that you you know for us i i say you know find a knowledge keeper an elder to speak specifically about spiritual protocols but in terms of learning part of the eighth fire prophecy was that we would share these teachings we would protect them through what we went through and then we would offer them and so there are some beautiful books like braiding sweetgrass by robin wall Kimmerer, who talks about the plant nation you know and she's a botanist so i find that's particularly helpful for people trained in the western sciences social sciences natural sciences academics you know who we are taught in universities that uh that this is mythology that you know, we call it, it's actually called the disenchantment of the world. This idea that rational thinking is only things that can be measured and seen. And yet so much of the frequencies of the earth are the unseen, um, which is what ritual and ceremony help us tap into, um, and the wisdom of the body. So uh, Blackfoot Physics is another interesting book. I really liked it. Uh, it's written by David F. Pete, a theoretical physicist. He's Italian, but he spent time with Lakota and Blackfoot elders. And he talked about flux the unseen and systems thinking to me that blind spot is about the unseen systems tend to think of things we measure and that's important you see it's not anti-science or anti-conventional systems thinking um i had an opportunity to speak at the stockholm resilience center in 2017 to the climate scientists and i had seven minutes to convey to them my concern that their mindset was anthropocentric um and and they've kind of followed up and that was one of the books I recommended was uh, Blackfoot Physics and, and Braiding Sweetgrass. There's also um, a whole collection of beautiful books by Leanne Simpson and indigenous authors that talk about, um, you know, kind of, you know, a, a question I had read about two-eyed seeing. Well, two-eyed seeing is, um, it's part of the teaching um, it's Albert Marshall. He's Mi'kmaq. Uh, Mi I had an opportunity to sit down with him um, at an elders gathering and, and his concern was that two-eyed seeing when him and his late wife Regina initially thought of it, which was, you know, you use one eye to see with kind of a Western lens and the other eye to see with uh, your Anishinaabe or Indigenous lens, um, that that was kind of dualistic. And he was a little bit concerned that people were, you know, it's, it's like creating kind of false binaries. And he was suggesting that he liked the medicine wheel and the, this, this four teachings as well. So um, the spiritual, mental, physical, emotional. So I think really what these are helpful for and how you can learn more is thinking about applying them. So when I was doing prototyping exercise with a team, they were really prototyping their innovation um, to, a, to a big problem using one of the quadrants. So they were, it was a very physical innovation, for example, or potentially a very um, emotional innovation. But what about the other parts of the medicine wheel and how could that contribute to holistic thinking, which is kind of more ecocentric or holistic. And those are the types of, you know, I think learnings. We don't have a website out yet, but uh, we are and Turtle Island Institute, we're actually developing a number of different workshops and trainings for people based on the work that we've been doing. And the other thing I'll say is it's based on a, a theoretical framework I've developed called cultural fluency. And cultural fluency is that prophecy that the gifts, the emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical gifts of all four corners of the world would come together. And the place in between those cultures, what really Ermine called it ethical space, the space in between the different cultures is the space of cultural fluency and innovation, um, which is a whole other talk probably. But, um, but anyway, thank you for asking. Um, you know, people can certainly reach out to, to Tamarack uh, also to get my contact info. 
Yeah, what we'll do is we'll um, list the, the, some of the books and stuff that you talked about and so that people can then look, look that up. And if there's any after the fact, you can share with us that we can put into a post email. Um, so there's a, a, we have time for a few more questions. Um, and so this question here is about um, what are some ways we can integrate, integrate eco shifts in public health and medical organization? So it's getting obvious that, you know, that many people in the current system that we have in place are realizing that it's, it's broken for a while. So they were just wondering if you have any suggestions um, to bring a new change to this system. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's interesting. I was on a, uh, watching a webinar this morning. Um, it was a conference I was supposed to attend in Salzburg, Austria, the Salzburg Global Institute on Climate Health and the Future of Food. And we were the panelists, four of them, um, one from NASA, one from the World Health Organization. They were talking about the broken food system. And I was thinking about that because we all participate, like self in systems is a, is a huge um, capacity, I think, of systems change work. Because, you know, the, the blaming somebody else we now recognize that we're kind of all in this together and that so much of what we do when we produce undesirable outcomes is, uh, is us participating in system. But they, they feel so deep rooted and so big, you know, like, like capitalism and the fossil fuel industry. And now suddenly that's really shifted because we're not in our cars, but then we're gonna go back to our cars. I mean, people are talking about the carbon footprint of flying and in the healthcare system, you know, that the sort of, it, it becomes a, a not a focus on wellness so much as a focus on treating disease. And so the resources, and if we have systems thinkers that are looking at the healthcare system um, and shift to a system focused on balance, then we would actually resource and shift resource flows, authority, power dynamics into something like alternative medicine. You know, people looked at alternative medicine um, coming out of the biomedical field might have looked at it, you know, like really essential oils and yet essential oils have been found, you know, scientifically, but certainly even emotionally to be so helpful, but science as well. And so the power of pharmaceutical companies and things like that, like it's all very complex. But I think systems thinking is a tool that health leaders um, can engage in. And the team I'm working with on traditional foods, you know, is looking at the fact that nutrition, which is such a huge part of our wellness is actually not a core focus in healthcare that it's kind of done on the side that you know it's new mri machines uh that are part of fundraising and not really innovative food and that's why the jokes are around you know the terrible food in hospitals and so i think that part of what we what we should do is encourage uh, a systems approach in some of the the leadership you know that we have um available and especially the transformative change on the land and when I've had the opportunity to take healthcare professionals um, there's medical humanities as a field you know where they go to art galleries and poetry I think whether you're being healed or you're a healer whatever role you're playing right now um, healing self and systems is a really good place to start to actually learn the efficacy of different things for your you know on our own mm -hmm. thank you so much um... I've kind of one last one last question. Um, there's been so many chats happening in the chat box of thank yous and inspiration and ideas. And so if you get a chance to go to the chat box before we end, go there because it's popping up um, for me. But one last question is, you know, as a as a person who is a white settler, um, uh, and I and I love you know I, I love the invitation to you know get to know nature and listen to it. I don't have access to elders, um, so there's a couple questions in here about that. How do we? But do it in a in a very um, what is it in a in a humble, considerate way. So how mm -hmm. how do I further that? Yeah. I mean, I, I had an opportunity to uh, go to Gorza, Slovenia a couple of years ago and participate in a ceremony. And it was people there who pre kind of industrialization, which, you know, and I get this question around indigenous knowledge, but we're all indigenous to somewhere in the world. And all of our ancestors at some point in our collective history lived off the land, very close to it, right? It was industrialization that 
that disconnected us and disenfranchised us from our, our food systems, for example. So I think engaging in any activities locally that you have that really connect you to the earth. And, and the example I'm going to give is a, is a CSA, uh, which I had never heard of. Um, I had an opportunity to tour an organic farm and they, they have a program called CSA community supported agriculture and you buy a CSA. So you pay up front for a share and then you get local organic food that you pick up once a week. And the season here is uh, 14 weeks. Um, I mean, it's sort of a privilege for us to have the, the capacity to, to buy food like that, but to also support local foods, which right now seems like a really, you know, kind of open people's eyes about how fragile our food system is. And so I think if you have opportunities to connect to the land in, in many different ways, indigenous and other ways of, of look at the work of social change people, look at the organ organizations who are trying to do things that connect us back to the land and to the earth, that that's a really important first step. Um, and one thing is to, to not be shy, I guess, in a way to reach out and talk to uh, folks, knowledge keepers when you meet them um, in a respectful way, but also to um, appreciate you know, the teachings of the ancestors where you come from. And I know people who are researching that they're finding out, you know, if they come from Scotland or they come from, um, you know, somewhere uh, where they can tap into um, a knowledge base, that that's so important because we were all colonized by industrialization and, and, and capitalism and patriarchy. And we kind of all inherited these ideologies and now we need to break them. And I think any work, and it's a lot of work, to heal self from those types of things. I had a, a offered a healing circle in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, just before Christmas. And there was a gentleman there from New York City, he was a, a black man, and he said, I'm healing from toxic masculinity and slavery. You know, those are big things to be healing from. I think we're all on a healing journey, and it's being able to acknowledge that and recognize vulnerability as, you know, as a major strength in that kind of work. And so anything that makes you vulnerable that can help you in a safe way a safe community, I think is all, you know, really good first step in, in learning more for sure. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just looking at the time. I'm going to wrap up here. Um, I don't know if I could do justice in thanking you, but I think if you read the chat box, there's so many better ways than my simple two words. Thank you. Um, there's just so, so many inspiring. So um, take some time to look through there. Um, we have some more webinars um, coming up. One I want to highlight um, is one that I am really truly excited about and it's theater for change, using theater as a tool for community change, bringing in arts in our community change work. So have you ever considered using theater um, for change around the world? Theater is being picked up as an innovative and effective way to open up dialogue tell stories and deepen connection. And that's happening on May 26th from 2 to 3 p.m. I'm going to definitely be on that one and I hope to see you all on that one too. But if you go to just tamarackcommunity.ca, we have a lot of webinars around a lot of topics. Um, so um, go there and um, keep learning. Again, thank you, Melanie. This was totally inspiring and my wheels are turning that maybe this might not be the last webinar we do with you. We will have a conversation, maybe post. Um, to everybody, we will be sending out the recording um, and any materials um, that we, uh, and resources that we learned on the call today. And um, so stay tuned. It'll be a couple of days before we can get that out to you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon, morning, um, evening, wherever you are. And um, enjoy your time that you have, the gift of time that we have now and your family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.